Good morning and welcome to the Gary Sutton Show on WSBA. Another gorgeous day out there, and I hope you're ready to have a gorgeous day with us. Thank you for taking the time to be with us this morning. I am Gary Sutton, and uh, glad to be with you here on a Tuesday morning um, of a week that's going to be very, very interesting. Uh, We may see a new Speaker of the House later on this week. Uh, We might see a new guy into the race here on the Democratic side uh, What about uh, Joe Biden and Elizabeth Warren as a ticket? That might be something we'll be talking about later on today with uh, Charlie Giroux at 935. He's the president and CEO of Quantum Communications. We'll also get into the presidential race, a little bit about Carly Fiorina and passion versus strategy. Um, You ever see these people on TV, former strategists, uh, and then they all talk about things without any passion, but, um, you know, they're paid to win. Uh, we'll get into that today. Selected topics this morning at 10.05. We've got all kinds of interesting things, including Gene Burke, who is a uh, an education expert. We're going to talk about smartphones in the classroom and how much good that's doing and how much bad it might be doing to students in terms of their learning. And then at 10.35, Deneen Borelli, who's uh, with Conservative Review. She's an author and Fox News commentator, will join us here on the Gary Sutton Show to uh, take a look at leadership in America and... Uh, what that actually is right now, and then take a look at leadership around the world. We've heard, heard an awful lot of talk lately about Putin versus Obama in terms of leadership, and we'll get into some of that this morning with Denise. Might even ask our next guest that question, too. And then at 11.05, it's your turn to make the call. We'll give you a lot of comments that were said the last couple of days by the talking heads and some of the people out there, and you can react to those. And today's also a day where at this particular point in the campaign, pick your candidate. Who would be the nominee for your party today, be you a Democrat or Republican uh, or somehow independent? Uh, Who would be your candidate if you were picking him today? I like to do this along the campaign road, even though we're in silly season right now. uh, and We have a ways to go. We are getting closer and closer to when the first primaries are going to take place. So who would be your candidate today? The whole hour is yours starting at 11.05. But first up this morning, always honored to have him on the show. He is a senator from Pennsylvania. He is Pat Toomey, and he joins us here on WSBA. Good morning, Pat. How are you? Hey, good morning, Gary. Thanks for having me. Always great to have you on. Uh, there, there's so much to talk about right now. I guess uh, the very first thing out of the gate, the most immediate importance, uh, what is going on in Syria right now? And uh, we're seeing uh, Putin stretching his muscles a little bit in that region of the country, uh, or that region of the world, rather. Uh, what are you seeing right now from your particular perspective? Uh, this is a uh, this is a disaster, uh, Gary, and it's the biggest humiliation for an American president, at least since Nikita Khrushchev, uh, Khrushchev beat up uh, on John F. Kennedy in 1961. I mean, but think about this from Putin's point of view. You know, he rolls in and annexes the Crimea. There's no consequences. Sends his troops into the Ukraine, and President Obama won't even send Ukrainians uh, weapons, defensive weapons, to fight for their freedom. He then watches as uh, the president announces a red line if if Bashar al-Assad uses weapons of mass destruction against his own people. That would be a red line. Turns out, has no consequences. And then the president agrees to a nuclear agreement with Iran that puts Iran on a clear path to having nuclear weapons. Um, Vladimir Putin watches this, and he may be many things, but he's not stupid. He knows that he can do whatever he wants with impunity. So he builds an air base in Syria, uh, puts his troops and his jets on the ground, and then sends a general into the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad and says, clear your airplanes out of of the way, Americans. Get your troops out of the way. We're going to start bombing in an hour. And they did. And they didn't bomb ISIS. They're bombing the very rebels that we have trained and we have supplied. This isn't even a proxy war. It'd be a proxy war if they used Hezbollah or someone else to do their security work. They don't, they don't even bother. They'll just send in Russians to take out uh, the the people that uh, America has been helping to uh, fight both ISIS and Assad. So it is an unmitigated disaster. Uh, Putin is in the process of assembling a huge sphere of, sphere of influence. You know, the United States kicked the Soviet Union out of the Middle East in 1973 when the Egyptians, um, under the... Um, very, very effective persuasion of, of Nixon and Kissinger uh, sent them sent them out, and they've had no influence to speak of in the Middle East right. for over forty years. Today, uh, they're the power broker in the Middle East. They're the for, the facts on the ground, and that means everyone in the region has got to recalibrate, um, you know, how they approach uh, everything, every, everything to do with international relations and. Putin's in the driver's seat, and it's it's a debacle for American foreign policy. I remember when the president came in, the thing he said, he wanted to repair all of our relationships that have been damaged so severely by President Bush around the world. And I look at, uh, I look at Iraq, 
uh, for example, and I and I see, for example, that we talk about we don't want boots on the ground, but we do want people fighting there. The Kurds have been up there fighting for a while now against ISIS, uh, have had some very effective fighting forces, and yet the very heavy armory that they need to fight back against ISIS, we couldn't effectively get to them because it had to go through Baghdad. So we look at that in terms of leadership. Uh, I don't know if they're still getting any more than they were then today. Uh, you mentioned about the Ukraine. We saw the Crimea taken. Right. Uh, we're seeing uh, you know, pushes elsewhere in the world, in Iran. We've seen what happened with Libya, uh, leading from behind. Yeah. And we look at all of that now in, in a whole jigsaw puzzle. It only had pieces coming together. And we say, what is the long term damage to the reputation of the United States around the world. You talk about undoing that which has been done wrong, uh, yeah. especially right now. How how would you assess that? It's. I think the damage is very, very large. The fact is our, um, our friends don't trust that we'll be there to support them. Our adversaries don't fear us, and nobody respects us. But this isn't just my view. Um, you know, there was an interview with a very prominent, famous American who was asked about this, and he said that he can't think of any place anywhere in the world where American interests are in better shape today than when Barack Obama became president. The man who said that was Jimmy Carter. It was Jimmy Carter. Yeah. Not exactly a you know right wing uh, uh, you know opponent of the president's, and it's the truth. And this is here, here's the simple um, uh, lesson I think, uh, Gary, is when America withdraws, when when a president of the United States decides that America has to retreat from everywhere in the world and withdraw, then it creates a vacuum, and into that vacuum step some pretty unsavory characters who do not share our values, who do not care about our interests. And that would be China in the Western Pacific. It is Iran in the Middle East. It's Russia everywhere they can under Putin. Uh, it's it's a it's a terrible outcome, and it's going to lead to you know further problems for us and for our allies. President uh, Obama's uh, veto threat uh, has come out over the National Defense Authorization Act, and it doesn't appear to be just about money. I was I was listening to Josh Earnest yesterday in the Daily News conference, and uh, he said President Obama will veto the bill if it includes the Guantanamo uh, provisions. In other words, uh, the, he said the current version that was passed through the House of Representatives is something that the president would veto principally because of this, of the irresponsible way that it funds our national defense priorities. But... Also because of the efforts to prevent the closure of the prison at Guantanamo Bay. So our position has, hasn't changed. We continue to feel very strongly about it. So you've got this, uh, I don't know what the timeline is on the National Defense Authorization Act. Would the president actually veto that over Guantanamo? Your thoughts? Well, uh, it's, uh, he says he will. Uh, yeah. This is a bipartisan bill. It's passed in both the House and the Senate. And it lays out the uh, the plan and, and a plan for the resources for the men and women in uniform. This president's policies has left the world a far more dangerous and volatile uh, place, as evidenced most blatantly in the Middle East. But uh, the president's response is, no, if he can't close down Guantanamo, he's going to veto the whole bill and jeopardize our ability to uh, you know, provide the resources for our military. I think it's unbelievable and, uh, and outrageous. The president has done so much. Uh, with the executive orders now, uh, and we've looked at what he did with uh, illegal immigration in this country, and there's still a lot of discussion over that. I, I was just looking this morning at, a, at an article, and it said uh, the president has deported less people last year than since 2006. Less people deported back across the border. I mean, we still have really no overall plan for the border. What is what is your thought about what's out there right now? What is the best way to approach this from your particular position? Well, Senator? Well, first of all, the president's uh, post-election executive order, where he granted effectively granted amnesty to five million people, was Still blatantly illegal. Yeah. Blatantly illegal. Exactly. Unfortunately, there's a court that has ruled exactly that, so right. it's not being implemented. Uh, but but it's hard to believe that as the uh, person responsible for enforcing the law, it's hard to believe that President Obama has instructed. Uh, his personnel to enforce it vigorously. So uh, there's no question there's a problem there. And and there's a reality that part of what it means to be a sovereign nation is to have control over your borders. We need to have control over our southern border, and we don't. We don't have adequate control there. Uh, I think that requires a combination of technological, human, physical barriers. It also requires a mechanism to allow people who actually just want to come here and work and be productive. There ought to be a way to accommodate that the demand we have for those workers and the supply of those workers, but through a legal process where we can check backgrounds, 
We can monitor how long they stay. We're on top of this rather than this completely uncontrolled situation we have now. So it's not making it illegal legal. You're talking about a work fees or something like that. That's uh, right. That's yeah. right. right. Exactly. A, a legal program that would be formal, have criteria. You'd have background checks. You'd have a mechanism for ensuring that people who want to come here and just and work and be productive and, and build a better life. But those people, I don't worry about those folks. Um, I worry about the people we don't know, and we don't know why they're here, and we don't know where they're coming from, and we just don't have control over it. You know, we look at uh, another continuing resolution the other night. We still can't get a budget. How many years has it been now since we've actually had a budget? You know, we all try to do that out here on Main Street, and yet uh, we have a Congress that can't seem to, to find a way to do that. Uh, and we heard different rattling of the sabers about this Planned Parenthood and the videos that we've seen out there. What are your thoughts about, you know, what... what I know you get a lot of criticism from, yeah. from your constituents saying you ought to close down the government for this, that, and the other thing. You know, the, the election should have consequences. There are many people out there, and I'm sure you've heard it from a lot of different quarters, that say yeah. Republicans haven't done anything with those election results. What are your thoughts when you hear that? And, you know, is something like Planned Parenthood worthy of shutting down the government? Uh, so so you've got a lot packed into that. Gary. Sorry Gary, about that. Sorry. I, I, that's all right. Yeah. That's all right. Uh, first, I have to correct you on one thing. It's true that the, our Democratic colleagues refused to pass budget resolution. Right. When Republicans took control of the Senate, one of the first things we did was pass a budget resolution. Right. We passed the resolution in the Senate, passed one in the House. They were identical. We have in force a budget resolution because okay. Republicans insisted on it. And, by the way, it charts a path to having a balanced budget within less than 10 years. And it give us gives us a vehicle, which I believe we are going to take advantage of in the coming weeks, a vehicle to pass a repeal of Obamacare and the defunding of Planned Parenthood and get it on the president's desk because the budget resolution gives us a tool to get that legislation out of the Senate with 51 votes. And I stand corrected so, on that, so forgive uh, me. So yeah. I, uh, no, it's all right. I, I mean, I hope we can hold 51 Republican votes on this, send it to the president's desk. Now, obviously, he's going to veto it, and we obviously don't have the votes to override the veto. But I do think it's important to demonstrate our willingness to follow through with what we said we would do. I agree with now, you. On, 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 and there's been other things that we've been able We were able to approve the Keystone Pipeline and send that to the president. We were able to pass legislation that gave us a chance to review this terrible Iran agreement. And if we could have persuaded just three more Democrats to join us, we could have stopped it. But, of course, uh, or at least we could have gotten legislation to the president's desk to block it. So but we've been able to get some things done, but the fact is it is very difficult to get a proactive agenda enacted and to repeal the Obama agenda as long as President Obama's in the White House. Right. I don't think he's going to sign a bill to, you know, repeal Dodd-Frank or to repeal Obamacare. Yeah, now, that's not to say we shouldn't fight him, um, but it's going to ha be hard to get him to do that. Last thing on the shutdown, we should not allow ourselves to get in the situation where the entire government funding is one big switch that's either in the on position or the off position. And we have only that as a tool to fight when we discover something outrageous like the Planned Parenthood videos. I voted in favor of funding the government and zeroing out Planned Parenthood, sending that money instead to other health care providers that would provide the legitimate services without these, you know, outrageous selling of baby parts. Pat, um, yeah, we need to take a very quick break here. I want to come right back to you. It'll be a short one. We'll come back to you. And I want to ask you about the Iran deal and also a little bit more about Planned Parenthood and get into that uh, with you. Uh, Senator Pat Toomey with us here on the Gary Sutton Show. We have just a few minutes left with him. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. This is News Radio 910 WSBA. Welcome back to the Gary Sutton Show with Senator Pat Toomey here. We just have two minutes with him. Uh, Senator, I uh, wanted to get you, you were making a point there about Planned Parenthood. Wanted to get your thoughts on that. Well, the point is, uh, I was trying to make, that, that we, we shouldn't be having these fights over the entire government funding. We should be funding the government in the individual legislation, the increments that focus on different topics, subject areas, like our defense budget, like our health and human Basically services. Basically a line item kind of look, right? And, and then drill down into the individual bill, and by all means, line out to items that, that should be zeroed out, right. plus up things that should be plussed up. Have the fight there, and if we can't reach an agreement... Uh, over, say, EPA policy, then maybe we shut down the EPA for a while until that gets resolved. I think that's a proportional response that makes sense, and treating the entire government like it's one big on-off switch is, is the wrong way to do it. Very quickly, Iran deal, and anything else that you're working on right now that uh, has some priority for you, under a minute? Um, 
the Iran deal is a disaster. I've got legislation that I was able to pass in committee last week that says before the president can lift the sanctions and release many tens of billions of dollars to this regime, the right. first thing that ought to happen is American families who lost people, who lost family members to this the terrorist regime in Iran, have to get the judgments they've gotten from U.S. courts. U.S. courts have awarded families of victims over $40 billion. Why are we sending the money to the regime, the terrorists in Iran, uh, when the victims of that very terrorism have not yet gotten the compensation that American courts have decided they should have? Unbelievable. I know you have to catch a train. Appreciate you taking the time to be with us this morning, Senator, and be safe today, okay? Thanks for having me, Gary. Thank you very much. Talk to you soon. Senator Pat Toomey with us here on the Gary Sutton Show, literally catching a train right now. So uh, uh, good to have him on this morning. You know, I... You talk and you and you hear what he said. He said, you know, we, we need to start putting things on the president's desk. And, you know, he's right uh, in that regard. I think one person's opinion, you may disagree, but I think it's important that you make people stand up and and cast their votes. You make it whether it's in the Congress or whether it's the president that you, you consistently go up. It's kind of like uh, what's going on right now with our state budget. It is important to put things onto the governor's desk so the governor has to declare himself, much as senators and representatives have to declare themselves. You know, it's 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 important to have your name behind something. It's important to be able to say, yeah, here I am. I'm accountable. Uh, and, and stand out there and stand up for what it is that you believe and tell us. And then let us decide. We are, after all, supposed to be the government, uh, not only of Pennsylvania here, but also the United States. We should be able to know what our representatives, who allegedly are representing our points of view, think on an issue. And when they disagree with something we think, it's important for us to understand why it is that they disagree and their reasoning. One of the things that concerns a lot of people that I talk about, or talk to anymore, excuse me, not talk about, but talk to anymore, is we are duped by generalities so many times as opposed to specifics of various things that are affecting our lives. They're too important to be duped with generalities. We need to have people, whether it's a governor, whether it's a state representative, a state senator, our senators, our representatives on the federal level, our president. It's important for us to get away from the laziness of being caught up in general rhetoric and having that serve as specifics. It's important for us not to have our eyes glaze over when somebody says, oh, they make a great speech. It's important not to have us be duped by celebrity, which then overtakes substance. Don't you agree? I mean, it is important for us not to get drawn and lulled into that kind of stuff. It's a lethal combination. And I think that we as the government, talking to representatives like Senator Toomey, who was just with us, we need to say, you know, specifically, what is it that you believe? What is it that you're willing to stand for? Because the old saying is, if you don't stand for something, you stand for nothing. If you don't stand for something, you stand for nothing. It's a, And I think that's what Americans seem to be thirsting for right now. And I'm going to talk more about that later in the show with leadership. We talk with Denise Morelli and also uh, later on out there uh, when we take your calls. It is important for us to demand answers. To write the emails to people when we're not getting them. To make calls to those offices when we're not getting them. Even if they decide to ignore it. To clamor at the walls of the Bastille here. To make sure that we they know that we care. Should we have to do all that all the time? No. Should we be able to trust our representatives to do the right thing? Yes. Is it happening? No. Oh, yes, there are some representatives that really truly care. I, I agree. I think most of them, when they go there, really truly care. But I also have my theory, and I've told many of the representatives that I've spoken to about it, that when you go there, and every one of them says, we're going to change the con- we're going to change the way things are being done. We're going to change the way work's being done there. And then they crawl into the little place called caucus land. They cross the bridge into caucus land, and, they, and the caucus immediately tears down the bridge behind them so they can never go back to where they represent the constituents, but they more represent the caucus. And that's horrible. And so whatever a representative will come up and we'll chat or we'll have lunch or whatever, and they'll say to me, uh, well, what do you think I ought to do? I said, come back wearing your honor and come back remembering that you're representing your constituents, not the caucus. They'll say, yeah, but the caucus has to get, you know, we have to do it. I said, I understand all that. But are you going to be the one to break the status quo? Are you the one that isn't afraid to lose their job and doing the right thing and standing up for honor? That's the question.